A lot of testimony from people who had run-ins with Jason Van Dyke before the Laquan McDonald shooting. We are waiting for a break to wrap up in this sentencing hearing that's stretching into the evening here on the East Coast. Uh, it's just before 5 o'clock there, central time in Chicago, where that hearing is occurring. As soon as live courtroom action picks up, we will bring you there immediately. In the meantime, law and crime president Rachel Stockman joins me here in studio. So, Rachel, we just saw this parade of witnesses on the stand into the afternoon called by the state to basically say that this Laquan McDonald shooting is something that almost could have been expected because this guy was a bad cop. That's the story the state was trying to paint here. Yeah, and then you have the defense witnesses, in my view. Obviously, the wife was very emotional, um, but the other witnesses not doing the best job to really can't counter the narrative that the prosecution was trying to put forward. Listen, I felt very, very bad for Jason Van Dyke's wife that she has had to go through this and her family has had to go through this, but it does not excuse what he did. And I think the judge is certainly going to take that into consideration during I the sentencing. I agree with that as well. And some of the language from the wife, you know, she said that her children had been bullied. They needed protection. Uh, she said the press has been way too harsh. She said, look, my husband provided security for Barack Obama when Obama was being inaugurated. And, uh, you know, she said she fears that her husband would be killed behind prison walls uh, if he is indeed sentenced here. Uh, painting a picture, wrapping it up, saying that he had no malice, that she prays for the family of Laquan McDonald. But then she went and said, my husband has already paid the ultimate price. And that sentence seemed to wipe out all of the goodwill she was trying to build up with the previous that several minutes of testimony. I have to say, I... 100% agree with you, Erin. Up until the very end there, you did have a lot of sympathy. But then when she directly said he's already paid the price and basically saying he shouldn't even have to go to prison or have any kind of punishment for what he did, I think that's where that she's going to lose people, for uh, yeah. sure. And, and certainly a lot of people have their own opinions of this as well. And, and keep in mind, folks, today's sentencing for Jason Van Dyke is coming on the heels of what a judge did yesterday, acquitting three other police officers on charges that they uh, somehow conspired to cover up what this particular defendant that we're talking about today did. Uh, prosecutors had accused those three other officers, there they are, of conspiracy, official misconduct, obstruction of justice, basically concealing the facts of what went on. David March on the left was the lead detective who investigated this Laquan McDonald shooting. The man on the right was the partner of Jason Van Dyke when he pulled the trigger. The judge decided to issue this verdict against those three men. A 10-minute break has turned into more like a 25-minute break in the Laquan McDonald sentencing hearing in Chicago. It looks like activity, however, is picking up in that courtroom. We're going to bring you right back in live as soon as we have word that things are indeed moving along. In the meantime, here in our studio, Rachel Stockman, we're doing the math on this and trying to figure out where the judge might go. Because as we've been saying, that aggravated battery carries a 6 to 30, mm -hmm. and the second-degree murder could either be probation or uh, somewhere between 4 and 20. So, so potentially <laughs> he could get as little as six years, uh, I think, according to this calculation, unless uh, the judge buys the defense theory of trying to collapse this all into probation, right? That, that's my that's understanding. The, the judge could turn around and look. I mean, my understanding of this, and, and neither of us are licensed in Illinois, but my understanding of this, folks, is that the judge could turn around and say, okay, I'll give you uh, the probation on that second-degree murder because it's allowable, and I'll give you six on the uh, ag battery. Uh, we've got a letter from a 12-year-old being read into court. This is Jason Van Dyke's daughter letter to the court. Listening to closing arguments in the sentencing phase of the Laquan McDonald killing, Jason Van Dyke, former Chicago police officer, convicted of second degree murder and other charges, including ag aggravated battery. The defense is trying to convince the judge to collapse all of those charges into the murder charge and let Jason Van Dyke off with probation. Let's listen back in. The judge taking about a five-minute break. He promised it would be short. Let's start the clock and make sure this doesn't run over. 
A lot of times judges do this, and in some states it's required by statute that the judge reflect on what was said in a sentencing hearing before making a final decision. So it's possible that Illinois is one such state, and it's possible that the judge just wants to make sure he does that so that this doesn't somehow get overturned on so simple of a technicality. I'm here with Law and Crimes, Rachel Stockman, president of the company, to break this thing down. So we just heard Jason Van Dyke get up there and say the last thing he wanted to do that day is shoot Laquan McDonald. If I'm remembering my facts properly, I thought that he commented like, oh, we might have to shoot him or we're going to have to shoot him on the way to the call. Right. So, so what is it? I mean, is he trying to convince people that this is what was going through his mind or are we to rely on the actual facts that came out before? Listen, I thought his uh, elocution was not the strongest. It was quite short. That's when the defendant has the opportunity to address the court at the end there. Um, I think he could have done a better job, especially addressing the family um, that have been affected by all of this because it, a young boy is dead because of what he did and you didn't really get the sense from what he just said, what we just heard, um, that he felt really remorseful about this. That's my opinion. You know, he's reading quotes, he's saying these things that he didn't really want to do this, but look, I mean, the whole defense case was predicated on the blame the victim thing, and, and look, I mean, it's pretty and, clear. And, and the defense attorney blamed the victim again during the closing argument, saying that this was a guy that had a criminal record, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, well, okay, so look, and here's the thing. Laquan McDonald was acting aggressively leading up to the point he was shot. The question is, should Jason Van Dyke have pulled the trigger in that moment, or should he have waited for the less lethal force, the taser or whatever, to kind of come out? Uh, you know, this leads to questions as to why not every Chicago police officer or every car has a taser. Apparently they don't. That was on its way. You know, would a moment, a, a split-second decision from that officer to just hold back, make sure other people are not in the area, would that have resulted in an arrest of Laquan McDonald, charges against Laquan McDonald? Right. Maybe we'd be watching Laquan McDonald trial and not the Jason Van Dyke trial. Yeah, and I mean, without having, we've shown that video so many times, um, but it, it, it's pretty clear uh, from the video that Laquan McDonald was not charging at Jason Van Dyke like he continues to say and and it's almost like there's a disparity in reality here um, and you know they the defense keeps trying to drive home that we're not seeing his perspective and here's the video we're seeing again um, the, the defense keeps trying to drive home we're not seeing his perspective if we were in his shoes he, you can see why he felt like his life was threatened Laquan McDonald was coming right at him, but look at it with me, if you would, one last time, and I'm sorry, it is a bit graphic, um, but he was, <laughs> there's just he was, no way. So, so look, I mean, McDonald was running towards the squad cars, responding right. from the opposite direction, right. And uh, but he stopped and he started to veer away because he realized he was probably at risk of uh, getting arrested there. Yes. So then, you know, and, and again, we'll watch it here. Okay, so we come up. It's, it's clear that he is running towards the squad cars. And, and you know, look, if... He is running if, towards the squad cars at first. And then it stops, okay? And, and then and, he and, you veers know, the other direction. If, if Van Dyke is conflating all this inside his own head, then my question back to him, if he were sitting here, was, okay, and you're a trained observer who's supposed to look for these split-second changes but in demeanor? But remember, in the second-degree murder conviction, that means that the jurors most likely felt that, yes, Jason Van Dyke was acting in self-defense. However... It was not reasonable in this circumstance. Yeah, exactly. No reasonableness here. And we've watched the video. I've slowed it down. I've zoomed in on it as best I could. Thankfully, we have the video. But, you know, one thing well, this that would I... Be a comp I mean, you would agree with me, Aaron, that this would be a completely different case if we didn't have that video. Well, here's the more disturbing thing. Some of the other videos and recordings are nowhere to be found. That's one that we have. Those other cars were supposed to have this equipment. That's true. Some of these cars were supposed to have audio equipment. And uh, according to some of the local journalism I've seen coming out of Chicago, is that batteries were being put into exterior microphones backwards so that they wouldn't work. There's one system, one recording system in one of the responding cars that investigators believe was damaged on purpose 
Okay, so, so why is that? And if that's the case, does the legislature in Illinois need to start passing a statute that says, uh, you know, that then carries some kind of charge uh, or penalty if you're an officer driving around without this equipment working? Well, I mean, if, if I would assume that it's part of the rules and regulations for the police department that kind of like they have to bring with them their service weapon, that they have to bring with them their bulletproof vest. Yeah, and what's the penalty if they don't do it, though, if it's just a regulation? Well, I, I mean, they, they just, it's a good question. I don't know because I haven't looked into their regulations on those matters. Right. Is it but, something that a court could act on, or is it just one of these things where, well, we'll, we'll, well, they it, could be disciplined we'll put a, we'll put a demerit wise. on your record and right. move along, and you're still but on the streets? But it's a serious streets. offense. If, if they have this um, equipment and they're supposed to be recording what's going on, and, uh, and they're not, that's a real problem. Okay, we're hoping that this comes back live any moment, folks. We're waiting for the judge to come back and issue an actual sentence against Jason Van Dyke, the police officer convicted by a jury of second-degree murder and a series of aggravated battery counts at the end of last year, this all over the death of that teenager, Laquan McDonald, whom we've been speaking about right now. Of course, that second-degree murder conviction, as we heard the defense state, carries a possible probation penalty. It's strange for a lot of people to think about this, but the prosecution addressed this as well. A possible probation for second-degree murder or a sentence somewhere in the range of four years in prison to 20 years in prison. It's the aggravated battery counts that are the more serious ones here. They carry a range of six to 30 years. My understanding of Illinois law is that they cannot couple them all back to back. They can't say six plus six plus six plus six plus six, plus six and, and just keep him in prison uh, back to back because this all comes out of the same incident. And because it's the same incident, they can't make things run uh, consecutively uh, the way that some states do it. And, uh, you know, so that's going to change the dynamic here as well, Rachel. And, but Aaron, and I did want to comment, too. I'm sorry to interrupt you there. We were showing some video um, of Jason Van Dyke from today's current uh, sentencing hearing. And I've got to say, I've been kind of shocked as we've seen him progress. He was just convicted um, in October. And his appearance from there he is today, his appearance from what he looked like, and I wish we had time to put back to back so we, we could see, but what he looked like when he was first arrested to his trial um, to this is really unbelievable. It's a change. Some of Huge our guests change. were saying, look, this is probably calculated. They probably told him not to shave, not to dress right. up. It looks like the camera's back live in the courtroom. We're looking back at the friends and family of Laquan McDonald. I think the judge might be back on the bench, so let's listen. And the judge just issued his sentence for that man sitting in the defendant's chair, Jason Van Dyke, former police officer, convicted of second-degree murder and aggravated battery for shooting and killing a teenager carrying a knife. Bottom line, two years mandatory, so he's got to go behind bars for two years or 81 months. So it's going to be between two years and six and three-quarter years for Jason Van Dyke. The judge saying that it's so senseless these acts occurred. It's a tragedy for both sides, both families. That from the judge. How he got there illegally, Rachel Stockman, is interesting. He turned around and said, okay, all the aggravated batteries, the sentencing range is more severe, but he said they all collapse together because it comes out of one incident. It was one incident, the okay. shooting. So it doesn't matter that there were a series of aggravated battery convictions, one for each bullet fired. They all collapsed together, and then the judge rolled all the aggravated batteries into the second-degree murder and just sentenced on the second-degree murder. He could have gone... Up to 20 years. Yeah. That's what's interesting about that. Yeah, and I, 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 we're, we're going to see what the reaction is, but I have a feeling the family and the supporters of the family are not going to be particularly happy with this because, you know, this man could potentially be let out of prison in just two years' time after being convicted of second-degree murder. So, listen, the judge said right off the bat that, you know, He's not going to appease either side here, um, but this is what he thought was fair, given what happened. And certainly the judge put some contemplation in it. Look, we are going to continue to keep an eye on this, folks. Uh, court wrapping up, uh, people filing out. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of post-court reaction, but we're going to sign off for the evening. Rachel Stockman, thanks for staying here late on the East Coast with me. Absolutely. Glad to be here. Okay, so we're going to bring you back to programming already in progress here on the Law and Crime Network. This ends our live coverage of the Jason Van Dyke sentencing.